Okay, everybody, uh, moving on to Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, the last one in our Oak series. I um, thought this was really fun, a great picture of snapshot of the, the wine uh, that you guys have in front of you. Um, one of the things I want to note is I haven't altered this uh, presentation a whole lot from when I gave it uh, to a degree in Colorado. I've updated it a bit for you guys, but uh, my favorite slide is the next one because this one. And here's the characters, and I wanted to give a shout out to everybody. You obviously all know each other, so I kind of went through and talked about it. But uh, I did want to note that, no, they really aren't that small. Ben is just that big. Quick detour, getting off oak. Uh, here comes my ADD moment. It happens. So <clears throat> I cut and paste this straight out of the document. And so Crusher added some sulfite. That's about it. And then we decided to throw the Carmenere leaves in it. Well, one of the things we didn't really do at this point in time is that the Carmenere fermented lovely, but the Carmenere had a very, very active ML culture. Not just kind of active, like super active. So um, we're looking at a pretty quick turnaround from the, you know, in a few days we went from, hey, let's check it to, you know, we're, we're blowing through ferment pretty quick. So here we go, here's our interesting teaching moment. So notice there's two axes here uh, on the left and on the right. And then we go down on the bottom here and notice the date and the time. So we were looking at 1018, 1019, and 1021 from left to right. And so the glue fru is actually represented by the axis on the right. So we, we ran a number because we were kind of getting close to dryness. And the next thing you know, we see that there's about, you know, 16 grams a liter of glucose fructose but the malic is almost gone on the 18th. So I'm kind of panicking at this point in time because I'm going, oh my, this is a really interesting scenario because we started out with a whole lot more malic than that. So the I go ahead and run it the next day to see where we're at. And this was on 1019. And I remember getting a number back and the, the malic had depleted uh, significantly, but it was running faster than the sugar was. So what we have here is we have a foot race. We have a foot race, uh, well, or a microbe race, uh, between yeast, which are trying to consume that sugar, and the malobacteria, which are about to deplete um, all the malic acid. But it looks like at this point in time, that malo culture is raging so fast, they're successfully consuming some of the sugar. And remember that um, uh, these little malobacteria, Enococcus eni, are uh, a bacteria that not only will eat malic acid, but they'll also uh, go ahead and eat sugar when they start to run out of their preferred food source. And when they make in a high pH environment, they make volatile acidity. And so uh, I remember on the 19th, I talked to, I think it was Daniel and Gary, and I said, hey guys, we need to probably worry about this. Uh, we need to maybe think about making a little sulfur ad or something to knock the mallow on the head, because sulfur will knock mallow on the head but it won't knock yeast on the head. So maybe your 10 or 15 part ad tends to kind of just whack the mallow bacteria. And so if you ever have a situation like this, one of the easiest things you can do uh, to stop a runaway mallow culture is if you, you co-inoculated, which we essentially did here unknowingly, um, uh, you can add a little bit of a sulfur addition and that tends to slow mallow bacteria down pretty good. And then as the ferment completes, it'll, it'll finish. Other things you can do is add uh, lysozyme to inhibit mallow. But um, realistically, a little sulfur ad is a very, very effective tool to stop that. And then they came back to me, uh, uh, you know, uh, the next day. And I think they said, hey, we want to do this, you know, X, Y, or Z. And they, you know, I gave them a couple of scenarios. And they said, and I said, oh, it's, it's over now. <laughs> that had to happen then. So anyway, the point is I'm not scolding anybody. I'm not upset with anybody. But it's a great teaching moment that when you have a runaway mallow and you're not sugar dry, your VA is going to pop a little bit. Um, that being said, we've managed the, the wine very tight. The volatilities are still pretty low um, in the grand scheme of things. So a pretty cool teaching moment just to show that uh, ML will make plenty of VA if you give them the opportunity. So the takeaway here is when you're doing nothing, you kind of have to know everything. Um, you know, and we're just talking about our little Stan Clark Cab Sauv here, which is, you know, probably 240 cases worth. But if we were to expand that out, we're talking forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of wine and we're a tiny winery. So when you're um, 
working at a bigger winery, you're managing multiple thousands and thousands of tons. Um, you're managing millions of dollars. So um, a mistake like that on a big tank, I wouldn't even call it a mistake, but if it was more significant than that, um, you could have a runaway issue that you'd be solving with the sweet spotter that we talked about last week with filtration. Um, the good news is the VA is still well aligned with our normal practice and probably is going to make our wine score better anyway. So roll with it. So here's our current wine chemistry. The only thing I want to point out is when I pulled these, these were samples that I pulled for Marcus's oak presentation that was supposed to happen on March 20th that didn't happen. So um, these were hand bottled. I would bet the sulfur's gone in a few of these. So if there's a little aldehyde there, I'm sorry, um, but it's the best I could do given the time constraints that we have. Um, so uh, we have a little bit uh, different chemistry here. Uh, so what we have here is uh, in tube number four, you've got the Tremu, uh, five, the Sarug from Navarre Forest, number six is Sarug Vosge Forest, and then the last one is a Sauri barrel that we have. The only difference on that Sauri American Oak barrel is, uh, I think it's got about 10% Petit Verdot, maybe a little bit more than that, um, and you can see that shift that the pH is a little bit lower um, and the VA is a little bit down, and I think that's from that blend down in PV. So try to look through that as much as you can. Uh, when you're tasting the wines. <clears throat> so back to the barrels. Um, here's where we're at. And this is what we have right now for all of these uh, wines. So we've got a uh, Tonnerie Tremue uh, and two of them. We've got two big uh, punchins of it. Then we're also sitting on all these Tonnerie Sarugs uh, where we've got the Navarre, the Chateau, and the Vosges, and the Allier Forest. I encourage you to go in and look these up. We have sampled these all separately. I just couldn't prepare this many samples uh, in time to give you all the barrels. Um, but it is kind of fun to see the, the differences in the, uh, the chemistry. Here's our Coopers. Um, so we have uh, the Tremu, which is a beautiful barrel. It's a pretty, uh, you know, pretty heavy handed barrel, especially because we're going to be comparing uh, this in a 500 liter to 225 liter barrels. And one of the things that um, is really fascinating, and I can't quite wrap my head around it is, and hopefully we can share the Oak Master Sheet, I'll have uh, Sabrina do that, um, is that uh, what we'll do is we've seen that um, in many cases, the 500 liter barrels should deliver, should deliver um, less than half as much, like 40% as much oak. That should be the case. But let's go through this and take a look at it. And what we're seeing is something very, very different when we actually uh, get into the barrels, um, and when we actually look at the, the chemistry. And I just want to make a quick note to everybody. I'm going to kind of blaze through this pretty fast. Um, so feel free to pause the video, take your time. Um, you know, don't feel rushed that I'm trying to push you through it. Go ahead and smell and taste and take all the time you need. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and go through these. So let's talk about those furfurals. And, and as we go through, notice that the soury American oak has a lot of caramel. It's definitely the dominant in this particular uh, arena. Um, and whereas the sarugs are very uh, moderate. And the one thing that Sarug will always tell you is that their wines, their barrels don't dominate. They don't become the, the major player. They just kind of accentuate the fruit. I would tend to think that's true too. But what's interesting is, is we look over here at this Tremu that's delivering almost as much methyl furfural or more of the methyl furfural than the Sauri and, you know, a fairly good whack of furfural. And that's a barrel that is twice as big, more than twice as big as, as any of these. So uh, interesting. Um, and uh, when I talked to Marcus, he talked about how the Tremus definitely toast a little bit hotter than some of the other people, and maybe where that's where some of this comes from. Uh, then we go to <clears throat> Guayacol and Methyl Guayacol, and uh, we see that the Never, or the, the Tremu is a little lower in this, uh, which is interesting because you'd think if you toasted and toasted hot and hard, you'd have really high levels of Guayacol, and it, that isn't playing out, but again, it is a bigger barrel. Um, whereas we get to the American Oak on the Sauri on the bookend on the other side, there's quite a bit more uh, smoke and roasted uh, uh, aromatics on that end. And the Sarugs are kind of in the middle. So kind of uh, just a moderate 
uh, level. And these are pretty low numbers. They're not overly uh, powerful. They shouldn't really just jump out at you as being overly smoky. <clears throat> and this is where the whole game changes. Uh, and I think this is true because we look at the Sarugs and the Tremu. And again, here we are with a 500 liter barrel delivering more uh, than 225 liter barrels. And I just think that's really interesting because here we have these 225 liters uh, in Frenchies. They're all pretty close to the same. And, you know, they're about the same price for a 500 liter as it is for a 225 liter barrel. So um, what that means, I'm not sure, but we've been seeing this play out enough that I'm starting to get a little head scratcher. Um, but then we get to lactone in the American oak. And this is that coconut whiskey flavor. And oh my gosh, uh, the uh, salary is running away with uh, the... Uh, you know, cisoclactone and the transoclactone is a li little different, but realize they're basically the same thing. One just is uh, stereoisomer, the other, so not a big deal, but a whole lot more in that salary. And let's talk about clove and uh, eugenol and isoeugenol. And uh, again, we're seeing the lowest number in the, the big boy, which I would expect in this case, this one makes sense. Um, but what's really interesting to me is, uh, you know, the the Navarre and the Vosges. And make sure to take your time and smell these. You know, don't feel like you've got to be rushed. Um, you know, pause the pause the recording, things like that. Take your time. Um, but um, the salary uh, just over and over again delivers huge amounts of clove. And we've seen this uh, repeatedly in the American oak. And now what's interesting is that we're looking at a $1,400, uh, $1,200 barrels, and then a $600 barrel. Um, and I just think it's really interesting to see how that barrel delivers uh, as much as it does, um, especially at the price point. Uh, for all the people that kind of are haters on American Oak, uh, really interesting to me. Uh, when I presented this at two other uh, occasions, the Sauri was the preferred barrel. Um, I quite like the Sarugs myself. I think they're understated and nice and beautiful. And um, and I think the Tremues come into their own a little bit later on, but uh, they tend to age out a little bit differently. And then we get to van vanillin. And again, here we come back to this. These are all pretty similar in the amount of vanilla or vanillin. Um, and they're not terribly different. Um, and th the reason I'm saying that's so interesting to me is we're looking at this 500 liter barrel. Again, should be delivering less than half as much and it's delivering about as much. So um, we've seen it time and time again. And, and I don't know whether it's just an ability of a, a, a wine to extract a certain amount of compound and it reaches a level or what that is exactly, but um, always been fascinating to me that the 500 liters are delivering a pretty good amount of uh, oak flavor and aroma, considering that they're that, that much bigger. <clears throat> All right, oak and aging. This is just a little something we noticed, and this is where we're talking about those aldehydes and the binding. And so what, what I always hear, and I've heard a lot, and you'll hear a lot in your career, is the old anecdotal stories of it just steps back. The wood just integrates. And it, at first you think you've over the wine and then eventually it just integrates and the oak steps back and becomes a part of the wine. And I've heard this talked about, well, what does that mean? So I'm going to do the Sarug one um, in particular, and we're going to look at that. And I don't have any samples for you to taste. Tasting portion is done. Um, but uh, in this barrel trial, they're all the same Cooper. Um, they controlled all of the oak from the source forest. Um, you have two of them in front of you. Um, these wines were all homogenized after pressing, racked to barrel, and the barrels have not been racked since filling in October of 2018. Um, we sampled these March 12th of 2019, then again uh, about you know, nine months later, uh, December 12th of 2019. And here's what we noticed, but the next slides are pretty busy, so try to keep up with it and, and take a look at it. Okay, so we want to talk about lactone. And so what we have in the blue lines are the 319 levels, so March uh, 319. And then what we have in these other ones are the 1219 levels, so down the road. So lactone isn't an aldehyde. It doesn't react with tannins. And so what we see in these particular wines is both uh, cis oak lactone uh, has risen uh, as these wines have been in barrel for a period of time. We just see this nice steady increase. And I'd be willing to bet you the wine that you have in front of you uh, is maybe a little bit more so than that now. Um, but uh, just, uh, we see that number rising as time goes on. Um, then when we go to eugenol and isoeugenol, 
Um, again, uh, not so clear on the uh, isoeugenol. There's a little bit less, but we're talking you know parts per billion. Uh, so it's pretty small, but we do see a definite increase in eugenol and isoeugenol, or eugenol for sure. So the clove aroma um, in all of these. And again, these are uh, not compounds that are highly reactive. So the longer the wines and barrel, we tend to see increases in, in these particular compounds. <clears throat> and again, guaiacol and methyl guaiacol, um, compared to where we were to where we are now, pretty much not a whole lot of difference except for the Navarre and the Vosges. Uh, we do see a difference there. There's definitely a little bit more early on, a little bit less, but again, we're talking tiny parts per billion. You know, we're at 16 parts per billion on the most and it dropped down to 10 a little bit later on. So, I mean, could be sampling error, you know, not a whole lot of difference with uh, the smoky aroma. Uh, and these tend to be phenols. They tend to stick around for a while. But then we get to vanilla, vanillic aldehyde. And this is really fascinating to me, is that we see these levels of these aldehyde-based aromatics come along and they release very early into the wine and then they drop. And these are in much bigger quantities. Look, we're at 600, 500 parts per billion. This is a much more significant number. And then remember, there's a lot of other aldehydes being created. These are just, this is just one that we happen to be measuring in that toasting process. So what we see really, really happening here is an integration with the phenolics in the wine. And um, I think it's really fascinating to see these aldehyde numbers drop as quick as they do. And they're just becoming a piece of the wine. Uh, and I say aldehyde because vanilla is an aldehyde. So it's kind of cool. Um, but it's really not as dramatic as furfural and 5-methylfurfural. And we are looking at some really big numbers. And so this is one of these things. Let's go. And I want to take a look over that Navarre uh, in the furfural uh, number and on the right side of the screen. And notice we're up at that 1800 number, uh, you know, a few months into uh, the barrel. And, and think back to your Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay, we, we saw a similar number to that in the brand new uh, Sanso. And we tend to see numbers really close to that in the Sanso, but they stick around the Chardonnay forever. Um, it doesn't go away um, because there's no tannins to, or phenolics to, to knit it up. And this is cool. Take a look at that uh, Chatillon and the Navarre, and how much there was and how little there is now. And, uh, you know, I think since this is produced in response to toasting, um, one of the things I asked when we were looking at these initial numbers uh, <clears throat> with, uh, uh, with the proprietor of Sarug was, I was like, I have a question. Was the Navarre made on a Friday? just before the closing of business uh, uh, was our timestamp on it. And was somebody trying to get out early because it just, it shows that it got toasted so much more to get these fur for all numbers up. And sure enough, it was made on a Friday and was timestamped out at four o'clock. So the Cooper, I think was trying to get the toast in, crank the heat up to get it done and created a little bit more fur for all. And this is a little bit uh, more toasted perhaps. And I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, that it did turn out to be the case. And sometimes that your research shows that sometimes just some little thing like that shows uh, something along those lines. So um, that we see that number really, really high and then just plummeting in the wine. And it, that's that integration with phenolics. So another way you can bat around the mouthfeel of the wine. So I'm kind of curious as to your thoughts on uh, if we do notice a, a tasting difference. So when we get together for this uh, masterclass, I'd love to hear if you perceive the Navarre is softer than uh, the other ones, or if that's normal or what the case is. Um, but pretty interesting to see those 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 numbers uh, integrate. And of course, uh, you may tell me, shoot me any questions, uh, fill them out in the comments section. I'll try to keep up. And I have to do a huge thanks to both of these guys, uh, Marcus, for providing all these pictures and, uh, you know, giving me a lot of background and history. And then, of course, Gary, for just being amazing at taking all of these photos um, of your class. Uh, that is such a rich uh, source for, for us to do these beautiful lectures with. I uh, cannot thank you enough. Of course, we got to shout out to ETS for supporting us. Uh, I just feel that that's a necessary thing to do. And then I actually have some different references if you'd like to go look them up. Most of mine are a bit old, a bit dated. I should look up a few new things. Um, but uh, uh, pretty cool stuff.
Uh, and that is it for Oak.